Responsible sourcing of cobalt has emerged as a hot topic within battery raw material supply chains over the last few years, due mostly to the significant production by artisanal and small scale miners in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, as well as the perceived higher risk associated with this activity over the production from industrial mines. Um, in this session, we'll be presenting some insights and consideration from a study conducted in 2020 on the impacts of responsible sourcing initiatives from Cobalt ASM in the DRC. Before jumping into the insights, I'd like to just contextualize a little bit this study. First, uh, what is presented now uh, can be read directly into an article published this year in May, if I'm not wrong, uh, titled Assessing Impacts of Responsible Sourcing Initiatives for Cobalt Insights from a Case Study. Um, this in itself is an academic paper that was written based on the, stud, on the work we conducted for and by the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, work that was looking at global, battery, uh, global, global supply chains of battery raw materials, as well as associated risk, and through a hotspot analysis that remind that we would focus on cobalt from ASM sources in the DRC, where we did some field work to collect data. So what was this work about? The objective of this field research was to evaluate whether the implementation of responsible sourcing or responsible production uh, initiatives on ASM sites had a, posi a positive or any kind of impact on the stakeholders and their communities. To do so, we have compared the two initiatives that were implemented on ASM sites at the time, which are the better mining that was implemented on the Casulo site, and on the other hand, the Mutoshi cobalt pilot that was implemented on part of the Mutoshi concession. And comparing these uh, two um, initiatives to uh, a benchmark of the sector and comparing those based on a number of issues, uh, social and human rights that were flagged. These relate to issues that are linked in the OECD guidance, Annex 2, um, but also in the IFC performance standards and that go a little bit further than the OECD guidance and consider things such as competition for the access of resources with communities and as well with some social life cycle assessment indicators that try to also quantify the positive contributions um, something can have locally. So for example, the creation of shared use infrastructure or the creation of better opportunities to earn higher wages. As a quick last aparte before going into the insight, please note that the data collection was done in 2019 at the end of the year. And since then, the panorama has changed significantly in the DRC through, among others, the establishment of the monopsonistic cobalt buyer um, state company, Entreprise Générale du Cobalt, EGC. However, the findings of this research are still valid. The first element of our research that I would like to present is that we have seen that um, initiatives have delivered within their scope. This means that both initiatives evaluated have shown strong positive progress upon the indicators that are linked with the OECD guidance. When expanded data collection has also looked at indicators that were linked to the IFC performance standards and the social life cycle assessment indicators. In these cases, the track record was a little bit more mixed. We have not necessarily seen a strong positive impacts on those indicators that once again are outside of the scope of these initiatives, but we have often seen positive impacts and in no cases have we seen a negative impact. This is to say that in terms of the impacts surveilled, initiatives have presented significant strong positive impacts on their core subjects, but have also produced neutral or positive results to additional reserve um, items that are connected to these kind of certifications, namely indicators on their IFC performance standards or the social life cycle assessments. In regards of what is under scope, something that the use of social life cycle assessment indicators has allowed us to show was that the issues that are, were deemed important on the ground, that were deemed the real human rights are not necessarily aligned with what the OECD guidance puts forward in its Annex 2. Most of the miners we have talked with, as well as 
um, related, uh, let's say, service providers, such as traders, food sellers, and so on, are above all worried about their livelihood, how much money they can bring back home, and how much money they can use in their day-to-day -day life and to plan for the future. This, for them, in their words, is their biggest human right, is the right to make a living, which is not reflected in the initiatives that we have, or at least not at a very core level, because this is not an issue that is clearly stated in the OECD guidance, which underlines the implementation of initiatives for responsible sourcing of minerals. Speaking of the scope, uh, we have also seen that the actors that are able, able to talk the language of responsible sourcing have been able to consolidate their position within local markets as they have been able to position themselves and market themselves as more responsible suppliers. Interestingly enough, these are not necessarily the scrappy little guys, but are more often the more established businessmen or entrepreneurs that already have substantial financial, social, economic, and connection capital, and therefore already have a prominent prim position that will then be able to use uh, these new demands to further consolidate their position. Uh, finally, it should be noted that responsible production initiatives, as we have seen during our, our study, are not implemented on their own. Obviously, they are implemented within a social and legal framework of the country and the region of implementation. But very importantly, they are also implemented in the operations that are already done by certain economic operators. This means that they work hand in hand with the policies of the operators, sometimes complementing them, sometimes supplementing them, sometimes being fully absorbing to them. But they are also often implemented uh, with the capacities, both in terms of financial time and importantly, human resources that the operator can actually dedicate to this. So this, except for some technical support that was given by the, by the actors, the designers of the supply, the capacity of the operator themselves that chose to implement those initiatives was very important. And as we have seen, might actually uh, become a bottleneck in the future, especially in regards to human rights, um, sorry, to human resources and the availability of skills to actually monitor uh, conditions on site and intervene if necessary. So what to do from those key insights? Well, a few elements come to mind. First of all, users should understand what kind of responsible sourcing they are using. This is especially true for users that combine uh, different stream of materials, uh, users that should then know what do I do if my material comes from two, three different streams that have different certifications or don't necessarily have a certification for part or all of the material they produce. How to segregate material, how to communicate on the matter, what kind of assurance do I have at the end of the day? Those are questions that um, users of the certifications, downstream users of the certification should, um, should think clearly about. Second, uh, it is really important to remind that responsible sourcing is, takes place within a local context. And this local context can be very difficult for downstream actors to, to wrap their head around. And sometimes it even is complicated for the very structures of the companies or the departments that they work with to actually take into account. If we take a simple case, apparently, that is child labor, from our perspective, from perspective of a European um, public servant or a corporate executive, child labor, no children should be on mines if they're under 18 of age to do work, as this is a classic definition uh, on, of the worst forms of child labor. However, if you are in a local context where there are no other economic opportunities, where you have many 16, 17 years old that are the head of their own family for a number of reasons, what, what does predominate as a human right? Is it the right to make a living for your family? Or is this strict interpretation of the ILO Convention of the worst, worst forms of child labor that dominates? And regardless even of maybe the decision you've come to, uh, what is the legal regulatory position of the entity you represent in terms of it and in terms of legal exposure it can have. 
So this whole issue of the local context is something that can be very difficult to bring back home and to communicate about for stakeholders in the downstream. This actually, I think, goes hand in hand with the, further, the next point, which is the point of, not, of issue ownership. Operators shouldn't only own the solution that they are using, the solution that they're implementing, but they should also be clear that they, they kind of own the issue as well. If you are engaging with the issue in your supply chain, which by all means you should, it is also clear that results will not be immediate. So for a time, your supply chain will knowingly have a big problem in it that can expose you to regulatory or other kind of sort of issues. However, this is not something you can wish away. This is something that you have to take ownership on and decide how to communicate about to be able to manage as an issue uh, with, generally speaking, uh, in your general communication and in with your relation with external stakeholders. Uh, progress also on that note will be incremental. Um, it will not be uh, just one step solution. Subscribing to a responsible sourcing initiative will not wipe all over your problems. No, instead you are embarking in a process um, and this process will take time. Progress will take time. Uh, lands in design will shift over time. Objectives will change, but you are, you are in for a journey, but it is a journey towards a good destination. But that's really something that should be in the mind of everyone is that we are looking towards gradual consolidation, good faith efforts, and not a solution to everything within, within six months. And actually within this process, new issues will emerge. And typically, for example, I think we've seen in our case, uh, availability of the right kind of skills and human resources on the ground might become a huge problem for the scalability of a lot of those responsible sourcing initiatives in the future. So what are stakeholders to do? Should they start training the appropriate personnel well ahead of time? Or should they hope that the, uh, the personnel will somehow come from other sectors and have the appropriate skills to be integrated within those efforts? Finally, I'd just like to remember, uh, remind everyone rather that it is not only about child labor and it's not only about cobalt. I took an example for child labor, but there's a number of issues that are associated with um, raw material supply chains for either the battery sector, precious metal, industrial minerals, or any other kind of mineral sector. It's not only child labor. And while child labor is associated with ASM, industrial mining also has its share of human rights and social risk. They are just quite different generally, but they're equally significant. And if we're talking about batteries also, it is not only about cobalt, it is about the entire components of a battery. And if I may, I would then redirect you to this technical report from the GRC, which in its first paragraphs, uh, first chapters rather, was looking at a broader level, the global level, at the kind of risk that, uh, that all mineral and batteries are facing. So just to briefly finish, um, I'd like to say that responsible sourcing is an important non-political tool to create better conditions within mineral supply chains as well as their connected stakeholders, but it should always be considered and understood within the context and given the time and the resources they need to grow. You Again, you are not having a key in hand solution to your problems, you are signing up for a process that will take quite a bit of time and effort, but that will ultimately lead you to a better place as a business and also as a global citizen. Uh, on that note, thank you very much for your attention and please don't hesitate to get in touch with me if you have any question about this research or would like to discuss the issue more generally. Thank you. Mm -hmm.